Good evening or afternoon, depending on where you are. I know we have people all over the place. Um, and uh, welcome to today's event, The History of Antisemitism, Kill the Hollywood Jews, The Pre-War Origins of Film Noir with Stephen J. Ross. Um, my name is Sydney Yeager, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Um, now in its 25th year, the museum is committed to the crucial mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of that mission, our programs illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate and anti-Semitism, stories of resistance against injustice, and more. So thank you so much for joining us today virtually. Um, we hope you will visit the museum in person to see our new core exhibition, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, alongside our temporary exhibition, Survivors, Faces of Life After the Holocaust from photographer Martin Scholler, which is running through June 18th. You can learn more and find tickets on our website. Um, we also appreciate the vital support of our members so much here at the museum. If you want to get closer to the museum and enjoy exclusive programs, member previews to exhibitions, and free admission, you can explore museum membership on our website or email, oops, sorry about that, email membership at mjhnyc.org to learn more. Closed captions are available on today's program and instructions on how to turn captions on or off will be posted in the chat, in addition to all the links I've just mentioned. If you have questions for our speaker during the program, please put them in the Zoom Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the hour. Um, today, we are honored to be joined by Stephen J. Ross. Um, Stephen is a distinguished professor of history at the University of Southern California and director of the Kasdan Institute for the Study of the Jewish Role in American Life. His most recent book, Hitler in Los Angeles, How Jews Foiled Nazi Plots Against Hollywood and America, was selected as a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in History um, for 2018. It was also on the Los Angeles Times bestseller list for 23 weeks. Uh, his previous book, Hollywood Left and Right, How Movie Stars Shaped American Politics, received the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences Film Scholars Award and was selected by the New York Times Book Review as a recommended summer readings for 2012. Ross's op-ed pieces have appeared in the Los Angeles Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, International Herald Tribune, Hollywood Reporter, Huffington Post, Daily Beast, and Politico. He has lectured throughout the U.S. as well as in London, Paris, Sydney, Auckland, Jerusalem, and Tel Aviv. Thank you so much for joining us today, and now I'm going to hand things over to Stephen. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, and I want to tell you a story that you've probably not heard before, and I'm going to pull up a PowerPoint. Here we go. Okay. Uh, for many years, scholars of film noir have um, dated its origins to the immediate post-war years. But more recently, new scholarship has suggested that the roots of film noir can be traced back to 1939. And I want to suggest today that the ideas and dark sensibilities, literally and figuratively, that characterize film noir can be traced back to real life experiences in the 1930s that proved far more frightening than any post-war film. Now, for many Hollywood studio heads, producers, and writers, the post-war sense of dread, of corrupt or indifferent cops, of criminality that went unpunished, and of nobody seeing to be <clears throat> who they seem to be. These are all themes that came to characterize the post-war film, uh, film noir genre, but they were in many ways, I would argue, born out of the pre-war experience of movie people in Hollywood with Nazis, fascists, and government authorities in the 1930s and 40s. And indeed, no film noir crime dra uh, drama rivaled the real life threats faced by Hollywood Jews in the 1930s and early 1940s. For when Nazi death plots and plans to bro blow up nearby military installations were ignored by local and federal authorities, Hollywood Jews responded by secretly funding a spy ring that operated from August 1933 to the end of World War II in 1945. Well, the dark sense of cynicism and corruption that characterized film noir came in part from the additional discovery 
that Nazi and fascist plotters were being aided quite literally by members of the Los Angeles Police Department and the LA County Sheriff's Department. And this wasn't a matter of a few rotten apples in the barrel, rather the entire barrel of law enforcement in Los Angeles was corrupt. The map you see here <clears throat> reveals the rampant Nazi and fascist presence in LA in the 1930s and 40s. Nazis and fascists are all in red. And what I would suggest is um, I couldn't put them all in because if I put them all in, particularly in the downtown area, you wouldn't be able to see anything other than sheer red. Well, <clears throat> the presence of Nazis in LA was, uh, as you can see here, cover of my book, the image above is Hitler's birthday celebration, not in Germany, but as you can see with the American flag, this is an American event that was being held at on Figueroa and 15th Street in downtown LA. And in fact, during the 30s, many merchants were very happy to fly the Nazi swastika flag openly on the city streets. Well, my story that I want to tell you today began in July 1933, when Nazis in Los Angeles held their first open meeting at the Altheidelberg Inn and promised to save America from its two greatest threats, Jews and communists. And at the end of the meeting, a photographer asked five of the brown shirts to pose giving the Hitler salute, and they did. And this picture was on the front page of news, LA newspapers the next day. Now, most Angelinos probably focused on this photograph and looked at those brown shirts and probably either thought of them as dangerous thugs or as Keystone cops. But one person who looked at this um, knew that in fact, something else was going on for the yellow, that I've had certain, you know, highlighted here, the very last paragraph in a kind of throwaway line talks about how um, any veteran of World War I, be he German or American, who needed food, clothing, and a, a shelter, a place to stay, could in fact come and receive all that for free in the basement of the Altheidelberg Inn. And all they needed to do in exchange was to listen to a lecture from the Minister of Propaganda, Hans Winterhalder. Well, one person knew that that was not a uh, open gesture, simply of generosity. For Ra Captain Robert Pape, who is the head of the first Nazi group in America, the Friends of New Germany, had been sent to Los Angeles in the spring of 1933 to organize Nazi groups all along the Pacific coast. And the soldiers who were being offered housing, as I mentioned, had to do so in exchange for listening to Hans Winterhalder, the man on the left here, lecture about what Hitler was doing for the new Germany. Well, one man understood that this was not, as I said, a gesture of generosity, but in fact, they were taking, the Nazis in LA were taking the same playbook Hitler had used when he was recruiting brown shirts in Munich and the rest of Germany in the early 1920s. Bring in disgruntled veterans who felt as though they had been thrown on the ash heap of history, provide them with food, clothing, and then military training, and to create a new army that as they would tell their new recruits, were going to save America from the day when communists rose up and tried to capture the nation's uh, government. Well, that man was Leon Lewis. Who was Leon Lewis? He was born to uh, German immigrants, German Jews, uh, in Wisconsin in the late 1880s. He went to wa uh, George Washington University to get his BA, and then went to Chicago, University of Chicago, to get his law degree. He graduated in 1913, but instead of taking a profitable job with a law firm, he believed in the concept of Tikkun Olam, of heal the world. And that meant he wanted to do something for his people. And he took the job as one of the three 
founding members of the Anti-Defamation League, and he was their founding executive secretary. And uh, two years later, in 1915, he was put in charge of the ADL's representative to the motion picture industry in Hollywood. And that meant he was contacting the Jewish leaders of the studios, producers, directors, writers, monitoring all Hollywood films for anti-Semitic images, trying to urge them to make films that had positive images of Jews. Well, in 1917, when we entered the war, he enlisted as a uh, private and eventually rose up to being a major. Uh, and while he was in the war, he was gassed. He experienced the poverty in the post-war era, helping with food distribution. And when he returned to Los, and when he returned to Chicago, he told his two bosses that the ADL now needed, in addition to having a national executive secretary, an international executive secretary to monitor the rise of fascism and Nazism in Europe. And for any of you who have ever worked in large organizations or even small ones, you know that if you come up with a new idea for a new group, a new committee, you're the one who's likely to be assigned the leadership. And that happened to Leon Lewis. What that meant is throughout the 1920s, there was probably no one in America following Hitler's rise to power more carefully than Leon Lewis. Well, Lewis, for health reasons, moved to Los Angeles in the early 1930s. And after the first meeting in July 1933, he became frustrated with the inability of Jews to come up with a strategy for opposing Hitler. And this idea that Jews were complacent and did nothing is totally false. That if you take a look from the moment Hitler uh, assumed the uh, Reich's chancellorship in January 1933, American Jews offered a variety of solutions to what could be done. The problem is they simply couldn't agree on a common solution. The two biggest ones being uh, Rabbi Stephen Wise and the American Jewish Congress wanted to get in Hitler's face to be very aggressive with him to launch an international boycott of German products until they stop persecuting Jews and all minorities. Whereas the American Jewish Committee argued that if you get in Hitler's face, he's gonna double down and just make it harder for the Jews. Well, they couldn't agree on a common strategy, but not having a common strategy is not the same as inaction. But Leon Lewis wanted a more direct action. As a war veteran, he had been a member of the Disabled American Veterans and also a member of the American Legion. And at the beginning of August, a week after the Nazi meeting, he went to Patriotic Hall, which housed all those groups, and he recruited four fellow veterans, the first being John Schmidt and his wife, Alice. And John Schmidt was his first and most important recruit. Who was Schmidt? Schmidt was the son of a uh, Bavarian general who had received the Iron Cross. His brother was a senior officer in the German army. He had been a German military cadet until the age of 16 when he left Germany, came to America, enlisted in the US Army and fought with um, General Pershing first in Mexico and then went over during the war, World War II, and fought against his own family on the side of the Allies. Fluent German speaker, prominent German family. And Leon Lewis thought if the Nazis are gonna to try to recruit an army, he knew that American soldiers would never listen to a German and Germans would never listen to an American. So he was gonna provide the uh, friends of New Germany with both. And he asked these four men, Lewis, uh, excuse me, Sean Schmidt and his wife, uh, Alice, Captain Carl Sunderland, who had been a member of the cavalry for most of his life. And he asked Carl Sunderland and his wife, Blanche. He asked Major C. Bert Allen to join. And finally, for a very short time, the only Jewish spy he had in the early years was Colonel William Conley, who A, didn't 
look like a Jew, didn't have a Jewish sounding name, but more important, he was the national commander of the disabled American veterans. And he had been traveling around the country blasting Roosevelt and the new Congress for its insensitivity to veterans because Roosevelt took office in March, 1933 with the country basically bankrupt. And the first thing he and Congress agreed upon was the Economy Act of 1933, which cut military benefits from $100 a month down to $20 or even nothing in many cases. So many veterans were angry and the Nazis thought the idea of getting the commander, the national commander, who is denouncing Roosevelt, would help them in fact recruit more American and Germans. Well, Lewis's order to the first three, John Schmidt, Carl Sunderland, and Bert Allen, was to join every Nazi and fascist group in LA and to try to rise to positions of power and undermine the Nazi effort and the fascist effort to um, plot against Jewish leaders. The idea was to get, and Miss Leon Lewis again is a lawyer. He never expected to run a spy operation for a long time. He wanted to get evidence that could be admitted in court. Uh, and consequently, he gathered recordings, secret recordings that they made. Uh, he gathered affidavits. And the first person he went to was the LA police chief, James Tugun Davis. Uh, the man, it is James Tugun Davis, known as Tugun because for several years in a row, he won the National Police Pistol Shooting Contest with both his left hand and his right hand. And it was Chief Davis who coined the term, shoot first, ask questions later. Well, Leon Lewis goes into his office, introduces himself as a veteran who had done some intelligence work during the war, and had gathered this information of Nazi plots. And about two minutes into his talk, Lewis writes in a memo, and when I open the box to the memo, I can almost feel the heat coming out all those years later. He writes about two minutes in, Police Chief Davis stopped me and said, you don't get it. The Nazis aren't a danger. The fascists aren't a danger. The real danger in Los Angeles or all those communists living in Boyle Heights. And Boyle Heights was the Jewish neighborhood of Los Angeles. And basically he said to him, every communist is a Jew and every Jew is a communist. They're the threats to America, not hardworking white people. Well, Jews weren't quite white yet. And he threw him out of the office. Well, Lewis then went to see the sheriff, the LA County Sheriff, Eugene Biscalouz, and knew he was going to be in trouble <clears throat> when he walks in and sees this signed photograph from the German Nazi council, George Gisling. And like uh, Chief Davis, Biscalou said, there's nothing I can do. Uh, he didn't believe the Nazis were a threat at all. And he threw Lewis out of his office. At that point, Lewis went to talk to the local FBI. And he wrote that they were actually sympathetic but they said, we can't do anything unless we're ordered to by J. Edgar Hoover. And Hoover was not going to do that because Hoover was obsessed with catching reds. And like the police chief and the sheriff, he believed that the real threat to America were the communists and communist Jews, and that the Nazis and fascists were just offering a different path and were not a danger at all. Well, not given any support by the sheriff, police, or FBI, Leon Lewis knew either he had to run this operation or close it down. And the problem is he had been running it since August and ignoring all his paying clients. And letter after letter came in, in uh, which I found in his files, of his clients saying, Leon, we love you, but you're not taking care of business. We're gonna to have to find another lawyer. And late November, 1933, he writes a memo saying, I either have to raise the money or I have to stop this because I'm going into debt. I have a wife and two children. I can't afford 
to keep doing this on my own. And so rather than quit, he goes to three of the most powerful Jewish leaders in Los Angeles. The first is Irving Thalberg, known as the Boy Wonder, the number two man at MGM, who many have credited over the years with being the real genius behind MGM's rise to fame, more than Louis B. Mayer. Uh, Irving Thalberg was also the most prominent Jewish fundraiser for Jewish causes in Los Angeles. He raised more money during his life than anyone else in the city. And the other two people were Rabbi Edgar Magnin, who was the rabbi of the city's most powerful synagogue, Wilshire Boulevard Temple, which basically all the moguls belong to, all the Jewish movie stars belong to, all the Jewish industry people, anyone who is anyone belong there. And the other person next to him is Mendel Silberberg, who was the most powerful entertainment attorney in Los Angeles. He represented most of the studio heads uh, in their personal business. He represented most of the studio heads in their studio business. And the same thing for most of the movie stars in the studio. He was, uh, the best way to put it, for those of you who remember the name Lou Wasserman, he was Lou Wasserman on steroids. I talked to people who worked with him then, who said when Mendel Silberg never raised his voice and he always spoke softly, but when Mendel called you and told you to do something, you did it. Well, Mendel eventually got in touch with uh, Leon Lewis and said, don't worry, we will get the money for you. And he called 80 of the most powerful industry figures, studio heads, producers, directors, and a few writers, and told them to show up at the Hillcrest Country Club, the Jewish Country Club, on, in uh, March 1934, and to tell no one about it, that this was a secret meeting. And on that night, 80 limousines pull up, and 80 men are taken, no women, 80 men are taken into a private room in which there are copies at every seat of the Silver Ranger, which was the uh, publication of the Silver Shirts. And as they look through these magazines, they find article after article, illustration after illustration, talking about the Hollywood Jews, uh, as you see here, the Sodom and Gomorrah, where international Jewry controls vice, doping, gambling, and something like this. This was made into a sticker, and it was put up on walls and telephone poles all around the city. Well, Leon Lewis knew many of these men because he had worked with them since 1915, and he knew that these were hard scrabble men who were not going to give him any money just because he was a fellow Jew. And so his strategy was to frighten them into generosity. And what he did is he began by talking about, you all are paying attention to your above the line personnel. And what above the line means, all the names that you see at the beginning of a movie, the, the director, the stars, the producer, the writer. But 80% of your employees are below the line. Those are the names that came on at the end of the film, the carpenters, the grips, the electricians, the blue collar workers in Hollywood who comprised 80% of most of the industry's employees. And he said, you're not, while you're paying attention to your above the line, what's been going on in your studios is my spies, my agents are discovering that one by one, your foremen are firing every Jew. And he turned to Louis B. Mayer, said, Louis, you got only one Jew left in MGM. To Universal, you have very few. Paramount, you've got none at all left. More than that, your chief, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, foreman is a member of the Silver Shirts. And he went on and on and he said, but even more dangerous, my spies have discovered the Nazis have a hit list, and many of your names are on that hit list. At the end of the evening, Leon Lewis walked out in 1934 with $24,000, a pledge for that, that year and for every year that he was running his operation, and that's roughly $400,000 in today's money, enough to fund 
an ongoing spy operation. And it's a good thing they did. Here are some of the people on the hit list. Well, fortunately, he had a number of spies through the years. Sometimes he would have his spies testify at House Un-American Activities Committee hearings. Nothing happened. And the minute one of his spies testified, that meant he was burned and he had to get new spies. Well, his most important spy in many ways was Chuck Slocum. Chuck Slocum, born good Christian, born in Oakland, raised in Long Beach, had joined the Ku Klux Klan in the early 30s because he was an ardent anti-communist. But when he discovered that the Klan hated Jews and hated Catholics, he was um, appalled. And he eventually found his way to Leon Lewis and volunteered his services. And Lewis asked him to remain as a Klansman while also working for him undercover. And it's a good thing he did because Slocum, more than anyone else, uncovered a series of death, death plots and plans for, sa uh, for sabotage of military installation. The first plot he discovered came in 19, September 1935, when Ingram Hughes, a failed lawyer and one-time linotype worker at the LA Times, issued, and a major fascist, issued what he called a proclamation. And you can't see this, the print's too small, but at one point in there, he writes, and this is again, 1935, I call upon all true Christians to join me in enacting the final solution of the Jewish problem that cannot be achieved by legislation at all. So somebody in America was talking about the final solution in 1935. Well, the final solution was gonna be death to Jews. And he had hoped that issuing this proclamation would create an uproar and people would simply go out in the streets and start murdering Jews. Well, <clears throat> That proclamation came, was put into every newspaper on a Sunday. And when uh, Angelinos woke up that morning, they found that proclamation and many of them were very disturbed. But before Ingram Hughes could mobilize his plot, uh, which was also going to be to hang, the initial plot was gonna be to hang 20 of the most prominent Jews in Los Angeles. The idea is that they would all be kidnapped. They'd be brought to this isolated park. They would be strung up uh, on nooses, all 20 of them. And while they were dangling from the noose, they would be machine guns and they would start shooting the bodies full of lead. And hopefully they could sever the uh, trunk, the top of the body and the lower body. So the lower body would fall to the ground. They were then going to tip off newspapers and uh, when the front page of the newspaper showed all these Jews hanging, that's when he thought the pogroms would start. The only problem is Slocum went to Leon Lewis and Lewis said, you've got to persuade him that uh, there's a spy in their midst. Because in fact, from very early on, from information that the police department gave the Nazis, the Red Squad, they traded information about with the Nazis, we'll tell you what the Jews are doing if you tell us what the Reds are doing. And they warned uh, the Nazis in LA and Silver Shirts that Leon Lewis was running this spy operation. They never told him who the spies were, but they said, be careful. Well, Lewis then went to Ingram Hughes and said, we can't do this until we find out who the spy is. Once we do, we'll get rid of the spy and then we can hang the Jews. Otherwise, we're all gonna go to prison. And so you said, we'll postpone it. And of course, he never found out that Slocum was the spy and nothing ever happened. Buzzy Berkeley was gonna be, one, Busby Berkeley, one of the people that was gonna be hung. And I didn't even know Busby Berkeley was a Jew until I started writing this book. But a more nefarious plot and one that came closer to being realized occurred in <clears throat> September, 1937 when Captain Leopold McLaughlin would re recruited Kenneth Alexander, the head of the Silver Shirts, 
uh, fascist Henry Allen, who was the first family of fascists in LA, and our good friend Chuck Slocum uh, on an operation to murder Jews. Now, McLaughlin uh, had been a World War I veteran. He had also fought in the Boer War. He had published three books on how to kill in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And on top of all of that, he's, uh, to go back a minute, you can see him scrunched down over here. He is somewhere between 6'6 and 6'8. He was the world's jujitsu champion at that time. And he had gone around the world teaching jujitsu, including teaching it to Scotland Yard and the French Surete. He was also the brother of actor Victor McLaughlin, who had won an Oscar uh, a few years before and wanted nothing to do with his brother, Leopold, who the several McLaughlin brothers who were living in LA all said Leopold was crazy and no one should listen to anything he had to say. The problem is what he had to say was, let's get rid of the Jews here. And this time we're gonna make an impact that the entire world is going to know about. And men like fascist Henry Allen we're so convinced that the Jews represented a danger to overthrow our country that he wrote letters to HUAC, House on American Activities Committee, saying he would be happy to kill Jews if it would save America. And he also did that personally here in his car. You can see right here is a um, plastic handle. And at the bottom of it is a two by four piece of wood, which he referred to as his kite killer. And one day he was driving with Chuck Slocum and pulled off the side of the road when Slocum said, what is that? And he said, let me show you. And he said to Slocum, just stand here. And he showed how this is what you do. You take the uh, kite killer and you put the wood part as hard as you can, thrust it into the Jew's stomach. When he doubles over, pick it up as hard as you can and keep hitting him over the head until you hear his skull break. Well, part of the plotters was also Hermann Schwinn, who was the head of the Nazi German-American Bund in LA, but also one of the four regional leaders of the American Bund. He was the head Nazi for all of the West Coast. And the plan that McLaughlin came up with is they were going to get teams of four men that were gonna be comprised of Nazis, silver shirts, and white Russians, the people who brought you the pogroms in, uh, Ukraine and Russia. And they would go to the homes of 24 leading Hollywood figures, 22 Jews, all the studio heads were Jewish, and two actors, two Christians who are known to be too friendly to the Jews, Charlie Chaplin and James Cagney. And many of you may not know, but Cagney in his early youthful days worked in New York, worked up in Harlem uh, for, a bunch of, for a bunch of Jewish businesses and learned how to speak Yiddish. He could speak fluent Yiddish, you know, one of the few Irishmen in Hollywood who could do that. Well, the plot was gonna happen on the appointed day, those teams would plant bombs at the 24 homes, blow up the homes. They would have fast boats in the LA Harbor for anyone who might have escaped. And those boats would be equipped with um, machine guns. And they would be able to take any boat that tried to leave with Jews and simply machine gun to death anyone who tried to go. Well, <clears throat> the plot was foiled when Lewis instructed Slocum, because this time uh, Lewis had heard about many plots, but this one scared him because McLaughlin had killed, knew how to kill and was ready to kill again. And he persuaded uh, Slocum to tell Alexander and Allen, his co-conspirators, that he had found out McLaughlin was planning to double cross them, that they would blow up the homes and McLaughlin was gonna go to the DA's office and turn state's evidence. And he would get a uh, free pass in exchange for fingering the three of them. Well, the uh, intervention worked. McLaughlin was arrested but instead of being tried for attempted murder, he was tried only for extortion. He had been extorting a millionaire in Santa Barbara. Uh, I don't wanna go into the whole story, 
But Leon Lewis decided he was going to play the long game. That is, he knew from his spies, from Slocum and others, that members of the police department and sheriff's department were part of the hit squad teams. And he, rather than embarrass them, he went to the sheriff and police chief and basically struck a deal, which is, I will not report this to the newspapers, but in return, next time I tell you there's a plot against Jews, you listen to me. Well, McLaughlin was sentenced to five years uh, prison, but there was a caveat. The prison sentence would be suspended if he left the country and promised not to return. Well, his brother, Victor McLaughlin, was in the back of the courtroom that day, and Victor went out to the travel agency as, as soon as it was over, bought his brother a one-way ticket to Liverpool, and a few days later, McLaughlin was gone. Well, film noir is fil filled with twists of men and women who seem to be one thing, and then in the course of the film, you discover they're someone entirely different. And here we have a true story that is greater than any film noir twist. And that is the story of George Gisling, the Nazi who is not a Nazi. George Gisling was sent by Hitler to Los Angeles and um, Joseph Goebbels, the Minister of Propaganda and Enlightenment. He was sent to LA in the 1933, that uh, May 1933, with one goal, one goal only, to stop Hollywood from producing any anti-Nazi films. Because both Hitler and Goebbels loved watching movies, and they were convinced that Germany lost World War I in part because of the effect of propaganda that came out of Hollywood and came out of England. And he told um, Gisling that he could use the German Embargo Act of 1933, which said that any uh, country or any studio, movie studio that produced any film that mocked, derided, or in any way cast dispersion on Germany, the German people, or German leaders would have all their films banned in Germany. And if too many films, anti-Nazi films, came out of any one country, the entire product of that country would be banned. Well, that was not a minor threat because Germany was the second largest market after England and certainly the largest market on the continent. And at that time, the 1930s, roughly 30%, 30, 33% of all Hollywood revenue came from those foreign sales. And so while many studios um, protested German interference, they ultimately listened and they kowtowed. Gisling was in the studios. He was watching the films before they were released. He issued a series of cuts that he demanded. And those cuts, with the exception of the Warner Brothers, everyone listened to Gisling. Not surprising then that Gisling became the villain of uh, Hollywood histories for many years, the Nazi, who is getting in the way of you know, American filmmakers. The problem is Gisling was not who he seemed to be. And I had originally thought he was until I was curious to see how, how did LA society, how LA non-Jewish society elites deal with this man. And so I read the social column of the LA Times from the moment he arrived until June, 1941, when President Roosevelt ordered all German diplomats to re leave the country. And what I discovered is he was by far the most popular diplomat in Los Angeles. He was considered one of the four best bridge players. He was considered one of the best dancers. He spoke multiple languages. He was entirely cultured. Um, he had gone to this gymnasium as a high school student in Switzerland that specialized in, in ancient languages and literature. And I thought to myself, I couldn't believe that anybody like this would actually be a Nazi. And I started digging and what did I discover? In fact, he was not, he was a German nationalist committed to overthrowing Hitler in whatever way he could. 
And starting in 1933, he became friends with Julius Klein, who had been an undersecretary of commerce at one point in the Republican administration, but for many years had been monitoring uh, Nazi activity in Chicago with his nephew, Joe Roos. And uh, when the publisher of Joe Roos was a newspaper man born in uh, Vienna who was writing for the Chicago Trib. And when the head of the Chicago Trib found out what he was doing, uh, he called him into his office and said, okay, I'm also the commander of the Nash Illinois National Guard. Your assignment now is not newspaper reporting, but go to this hotel room and you're gonna meet a army colonel and whatever he tells you to do, you do. So uh, Joe Roos went to that hotel room. He met with the colonel. Colonel asked him to describe what he and his uncle were doing. And at the end, Colonel said, you and your uncle are incredibly brave, but you're foolish. You're gonna be caught and you're gonna be killed. I'm gonna turn you over to my um, counter espionage people and they're gonna teach you everything you need to know about counter espionage, how to jump in and out of big holes, how to go in and out of a hotel without being caught, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the colonel is somebody you may all have heard of, George, then Colonel George Marshall, eventually General George Marshall, creator of the Marshall Plan. And that started a friendship between uh, Marshall, Roos, and Julius Klein. And in fact, when I was looking at Nuremberg records, I found a letter from Julius Klein to uh, the tribunal in Nuremberg saying, this is the first and only time I will ever write a character reference for a Nazi because George Gisling is no Nazi. He's a German nationalist who's been working to overthrow the government. And starting in 1933, he gave me information about the German economy. And uh, in the late 30s, he found and gave me information about German war plans. Please let him go. And a few weeks later, Gisling was released. Well, on December 8th, the day after Pearl Harbor, the FBI came in and rounded up uh, all the Nazis. Within 24 hours, they rounded up 90 of the major Nazi and fascist leaders, including Hermann Schwinn. And I was confused by this because I had requested Hermann Schwinn's Freedom of Information Act file. And uh, when I got it, the FBI records only began in January, 1942. So if that's the case, how did the FBI know who to arrest? Well, starting in September, 1939, Joe Roos and Leon Lewis had kept the careful record of every Nazi, every fascist, every suspected fascist and Nazi and all their organizations and sent a several hundred page report each year that they would update every September to Army Intelligence, Navy Intelligence and the FBI. And on the morning of December 8th, uh, a list was sent to the FBI in LA, uh, specifying groups A, B, and C, with A being the most dangerous. And as I looked at those lists, they looked awfully familiar. And sure enough, I tracked down the memo they had sent, which had divided uh, the Nazis in LA at the end into who are the most dangerous, group one, the most dangerous, group two, put under surveillance group three, monitor as needed. And the FBI simply rewrote the list, took full credit for capturing the Nazis and fascists and never acknowledged the work of Leon Lewis. In fact, Lewis died. The only award he ever got was an Americanism award from the American Legion in June, 1939. Well, how does this connect to Film Noir, well, towards the end of the war, Lewis convened a committee of many of the people he knew well and said, let us start thinking about movies for the post-war era. And the Americanism Committee was supposed to come up with themes, but many of them had been people on those hit lists. In addition to trying to make pro, quote, American movies to make you feel good, they also had their writers write about things that they knew which was the dangers and twists they had seen during the Nazi 30s. And many of them drew from their own experiences with 
the police and with the sheriff's department and with the FBI to have a very jaundiced view of law enforcement and American life. Well, the lesson for today, I think, is far from a film noir lesson. It is about the courage to oppose anti-democratic forces, even when authorities turned a blind eye. And what's so interesting about Leon Lewis's operation is virtually every one of his spies was a Christian, but they and they knew they were working for Leon Lewis, who was a Jew, but they never felt they were working for the Jews. They were working for America because they believed that what true freedom and democracy meant is that when one group came in and targeted for death another group because of their race, their religion, their ethnicity, it was the fundamental obligation of every American to stop that from happening. And without ever picking up a gun, without using any kind of weapons other than their brains, this two-man operation foiled a series of Nazi plots, not just the ones I mentioned today, but blowing up aircraft factories, blowing up military installations along the docks of uh, San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. And uh, it is a lesson worth remembering today. Let me stop now and um, take some questions from the audience. Thank you so much for that presentation, Stephen. I did not know any of that, so that was super fascinating. So we've had um, a few questions come in, and you know, please continue to um, submit your questions. But I want to begin um, with a question that came in and actually connects to some previous programs we've done at the museum. Were were there connections between groups in LA and you know fascist and Nazi groups on the East Coast, like Father Coughlin and um, you know Nazi groups operating um, over in New York and other areas? What do you mean by is there a connection? Were they were they operating in tandem, or were these sort of individual groups? Um, like were the Nazis kind of uh, that you discussed? Were they part of sort of a national movement? Or yes, they were part of a national movement. But the plots that I have here were local plots. I mean, the Bund was a national organization that mm -hmm. had uh, local leaders, local Führers. But then mm -hmm. there were four regional leaders, and they would meet from time to time. And uh, Hermann Schwinn, who I talked about, was one of those four and was considered the second most powerful Nazi in America. Okay. And then uh, we have another question that came in. Um, what became of um, these Nazis, the ones that you talked about that weren't necessarily arrested? Um, what happened to them once Hitler declares war and when we go to war with Germany? Well, guess what? You don't know about this because they were basically all released. The, um, to only two of them, well, actually, several of them, the two Nazis, the two main Bund leaders, Hermann Schwinn and his Lieutenant Hans Deibel were mm -hmm. arrested and put in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, they, along with several others, uh, were sent to Washington to face the trial for sedition. And as I see somebody here has the Rachel Maddow series. For those of you listening who have not heard her podcast, Rachel Maddow presents Ultra. Um, the ultra stands for ultra nationalists, and it is a story of, that leads us up to the sedition hearings, which eventually were um, simply canceled because the judge died before there could be a decision, and the Justice Department decided that they weren't going to keep prosecuting anyone anymore. They were going to simply move on, you know, better to move on. And I will tell you, folks, one of the lessons that I've learned from history is when anyone, anyone tells you after a war, it's time to move on, it is never time to move on. It's time to do a truth and uh, reconciliation and a truth and what have we done commission to actually confront what we have done, kind of like we've done with the January 6th insurrection. Um, for Schwinn, uh, Hans Deibel was released in 1945 shortly after the war ended. Schwinn stayed uh, in prison until 1947. He was then allowed to leave the country and he went to Argentina where his wife and child had, an American born wife and child had gone. But after a few years, the wife and child decided they did not wanna live amongst all these Nazis in Argentina. They came back to America 
And Hermann Schwinn eventually decided he wanted to live with his wife and child. And in one of the great ironies, where did he go? He wound up the rest of his life in Dade County, Florida, in uh, near Dade and Broward counties, had the largest collection of survivors of anywhere in the country, uh, outside of New York probably, but many of those people eventually wound up. And he lived only a few miles from where my parents, who were both Holocaust survivors, were living. And I always wondered, what did he tell his neighbors he did during the war? In short, the long-winded way to conclude this is the government did very little to prosecute any Nazis or fascists. Mm -hmm. um, so another kind of interesting question with a big name that came in, um, was Walt Disney involved in any of these pro-Nazi efforts? I know he had you know, uh, those kind of beliefs and, and leanings, but was he involved at all? In funding? All I know is that Walt Disney at one point, as did Henry Fonda, uh, mm -hmm. visited uh, the uh, Deutsche House, which is where the Nazi headquarters were. They had a big building on uh, Figaro and 15th Street. But I never saw anything that he was actively involved. We know that he did not love Jews, but I didn't find him being actively involved in any of the Nazi or fascist campaigns. Okay. Um, and then another question that came in um, was, uh, was it Jack Warner or someone else who made the decision to finally do anti-Nazi films like Confessions of a Nazi Spy and The Seahawk? And um, how did this eventually spread to other studios? Uh, that came about, it wasn't so much just Jack, it was really more Harry Warner than Jack Warner. And Harry had been but both brothers, all the brothers wanted to do an anti-Nazi film. But Hollywood had passed something called the Production Code in 1934. And that said, if you want to get your movie in a first run theater, uh, you had to get a Production Code seal. And Section 10 of the Production Code uh, mirrored what the Germans had written into their Embargo Act, that anyone, any studio that makes uh, an anti not any studio that makes a film that defames, mocks, or in any way denigrates a foreign country or its leaders. Then he didn't mention Germany. Any foreign country would not be eligible to get a seal. Well, 80% mm -hmm. of your revenue came from being in those first run theaters. So unless you got a seal, you couldn't get into the theater, which meant you're going to lose a lot of money. Well, mm -hmm. the one exception was this was not a film that was going to mock in any way the German government. It was based on a real live court case. The mm -hmm. FBI had arrested a series of Nazi spies. Uh, the FBI agent in charge, Leon Turo, was a Jew. And when J. Edgar Hoover found that Turo was going to make an announcement about this, he uh, got ahead of him. And before Turo had arrested the main leaders, he had arrested the minor functionaries. Hoover announced this and gave it the leaders time to flee the country, but they still were tried in absentia and, uh, and, and Warner sent a writer, screenwriter to cover the trial. Trial ended in December, 1937 uh, and in um, well, no, 38 and in 39, uh, that April, they turned it into a film called Confessions of a Nazi Spy. That became the first anti-Nazi film. And because it was a true story, it could get a production code seal. But by January 1940, the uh, production code decided to lift that restriction on uh, making films that in any way attack foreign governments or leaders. And starting in 1940s, you would see a whole series of anti-Nazi films coming out of all the studios because no one would suffer a financial loss simply based on making an anti-Nazi movie. Gotcha. Um, so we're getting actually a couple of different questions about this. So I'm going to kind of combine a few of them. But can you can you go a little bit into more depth about how Gisling was uh, sort of anti-Nazi and how he was fighting against um, the Nazi cause, um, you know, other than what you already covered, was there any other things he was actively doing? Uh, well, he was, his friends were, the group of his friends were the ones who had the failed uh, assassination attempt on Hitler's life. 
he was, as I said, consistently just not just those two things I mentioned, the economy and the war plans, but from 33 until 41, he kept passing at danger to his own life, all this information to uh, Julius Klein, knowing that Klein was passing it on to George Marshall, that it was getting right to the military heads and into the American government. And what's interesting is when he went back to Germany in June 1941, uh, I had a researcher who was going through the foreign department um, in Germany and had found all this correspondence from many of the Bund members in LA writing to uh, German leaders, including Hitler, saying, get rid of Gisling. He's not a real Nazi. He's, yeah, he's doing this stuff in the studios, but we want him to get much more active about um, fighting the Jewish problem here. And when we've asked them for money to, you know, for more, more efforts for us to have more anti-Jewish events, he's refused to cooperate with us. Well, that all those complaints were ignored because he was doing his job. But the moment he got back to Germany, he was taken to Gestapo headquarters. And before he left, I wound up, I know a lot of this because I wound up interviewing his daughter before she died. Um, and uh, his daughter, who was quite something, even as a 13 year old, she was born in New York and lived here until she was 13. He told his daughter, the Gestapo is gonna bring me in and they will probably talk to you. Be a dumb teenager. Don't show that you know anything. Don't show them how smart you are. Just be silly and you know, don't answer their questions. Well, they released him after three days, but he knew his days were gonna be numbered because eventually once the assassination attempt happened, they were gonna track down all the friends. And so he got uh, his friend Schwend, whose name, first name I forget, to uh, have the German government send him to Murano, Italy, because Schwend had been in, uh, put in charge of a counterfeiting operation, which was made into a film whose name I forget right now. They were going to print uh, false 20 pound notes and flood the world market with 20 pound British notes and destroy the British economy. And he asked uh, that Gisling be made his assistant in this project. Well, Gisling went down, never really worked with him. But what Gisling did do is in early 1945, he traveled to Switzerland, uh, unbeknownst to anyone, where he met with um, the head of the OSS in Switzerland and arranged uh, Alan Dulles and arranged for the German surrender of all German troops in Northern Italy. Mm -hmm. And that was, he did that with two or three generals. And as soon as they surrendered, he was sent to prison in Nuremberg where he stayed for several years until they received the letter from Julius Klein. Wow. It's quite That's an cool. amazing story. That is amazing. Um, so I know we're getting towards the end of the hour, but uh, I hope you're okay if we go just a little bit over because we have sure. so many questions. Um, so one other question that uh, I was also actually wondering about. So when the studio heads were told that they're below the line Jews that you talked about uh, earlier were being fired, um, what did they do about going about and fixing that, if anything at all? Actually, I don't know what they did because that, that's not in the records. Um, <clears throat> but I know they, I'm going to guess that some of them uh, fired the foreman and got others in there. Gotcha. Um, and then this is kind of a, an interesting question. What, um, I'm going to change it a little bit though. What film noir films of the era do you recommend um, from this time? Uh, you know, my personal favorite is Double Jeopardy, but there are none that I recommend that um, <laughs> really tell this story at all. This story has never been told. And what to me is amazing is that this may be the only time in 5,000 years of Jewish history that Jews kept a secret because none of the moguls ever wrote about this in their memoirs, none of them. They were all sworn to secrecy and no one ever said anything. And mm -hmm. I have a feeling that some of it was that the Nazis had sworn 
that they would get revenge. And it didn't matter whether there was a war, no war, no matter how long it took, they would take revenge on um, whoever did this to them. And at one point they did, Joe Roos was walking with his son, who I interviewed, and his son said, all of a sudden one day, two guys, this is after the war's over, two guys pull up and get out and start beating him up. Uh, and he said, you know, I thought they could kill my father until a bunch of other people came out on the street and said, what's going on? And they drove away. And uh, I'm pretty sure that one, I'm positive, and another, I'm pretty sure that two of Leon Lewis's spies died under very suspicious circumstances. And I, I'm pretty convinced they were killed by the Nazis. Wow. Um, so I think that this is a good question to end on. Um, oh, let me find it. Sorry, it disappeared. All right. So you you talked a little bit about this um, at the end of your presentation, but what are the most important parallels you see between everything you've talked about and what's going on today, especially the things that you think not enough people are talking about? Yeah, what I would say is it's not about parallels, it's about continuity. That's the thing we don't understand, that these uh, groups, uh, the fascists and Nazis, they're very clever because after the war, yes, yeah, some of them call themselves Nazis, but many of them now call themselves nationalists. Mm. That is, What's the difference between a Nazi and a nationalist? Nothing. Mm -hmm. They hate Jews, they hate blacks, they hate people of color, they hate everyone essentially who's not a white Christian. And mm -hmm. they have never stopped hating. And if people think that uh, Donald Trump was responsible for the Capitol riots, they're wrong. That mm -hmm. this, the book I'm working on now is a kind of follow-up that starts in 1945 when I argue that was the beginning of the second civil war, that many of the people who came back from war came back feeling betrayed by their country. You know, we think that Tom Brokaw, greatest generation, but Brokaw never writes about those people and mainly in the South and Southwest who went mm -hmm. off to war not to fight Hitler and Mussolini, but they went off to war because Japan bombed us. And when someone attacks you, you attack back. And when they came back, they went off to war as patriots. And they came back and they said, we've been betrayed by our country. While we were overseas, Congress, this liberal Northern Jew inflected Congress has passed all these laws that make it easier for blacks and Jews to compete with us for jobs and housing. And they get angry and they start a series of hate groups. Um, two of them that I write about, the Colombians and the Stoner, anti -Christ and, uh, the Christian anti-Jewish party, are so extreme that the Ku Klux Klan expels them for being too extreme in their racial views. You have a group in New York, the National Renaissance Party. And then you have the sort of another, the um, George Lincoln Rockwell. These people are all continuing the fight. They have never stopped. And that they in turn train others. And I can show you a timeline of how we can go from 1945 to the Aryan Nation, Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, they all, they, they or their grandparents were participating in these organizations for decades. And that's what's the important take home. It isn't like, okay, it stops at the end of the war and then Donald Trump's elected president and it starts again. It never disappeared. Donald Trump just made it possible for them to come out from under the rocks and expose themselves. Well, thank you so much um, for doing this. I don't know if you have any final words that you want to say before we end um, or anything like that. I think what you just said was very powerful. So, <laughs> Well, that is it. The, less, the take home lesson is vigilance in that, um, you know, the one thing everyone can do, everyone mm -hmm. who's a citizen is make sure you vote. And more importantly, take some, take one other person. You know, Moses, Moses Maimonides writes something that I know in our prayer book at my synagogue, they would print every year during the high holidays. I don't ask you to be like Moses. I only ask you to be the best of yourself. So you don't have to conquer all these hate groups by yourself, but every one of us could try to get one friend who might be reluctant to vote or just, ah, you know, I'm too blah, 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 go out and vote. 
And the other thing that's a little more difficult, if you hear hate speech, turn to the person and say, you know what? We don't talk that way in America. You know, mm -hmm. whatever you may think, that's fine. But you don't talk out loud hate group. We're Americans. We don't hate on one another. Mm -hmm. And if enough people say that, these people will stop talking publicly. Well, thank you so much. This has been, we're getting so many uh, like kudos in the chat and everything. This has been really amazing. I personally learned so much. So thank you to everyone also who has joined us this evening. Um, and, and thank you, Stephen, for staying a little bit over the hour as well. We really appreciate it.